When I was in my mid-twenties, before, long before, I went to uh, preacher school, I worked in the movie theater business. I've been doing it for years, starting out as an usher when I was 15 years old, tearing tickets, and eventually working my way up to becoming a manager and handling some remodeling and new construction projects in different parts of the country. I learned everything there was to know about that business, and I even figured that one day I might have my own theater chain. That would be cool. At one point, I hired a guy about my age who said he just wanted to spend a few months learning how this movie theater thing worked. Everything from making popcorn to managing employees to booking and scheduling films to advertising to running a movie projector to how sound systems work to buying commercial real estate. One day, he told me he had an idea for a new kind of movie theater, a hybrid theater and restaurant. But so the customer would buy a movie ticket, order a hamburger or a pizza and a beer, and then sit in the auditorium where your food and drinks would be brought to you. Instead of row after row of seats, they would take out every other row to make space for a long table so you'd have a place to set down your meal right there in front of you. Now, he was a really nice guy. We got along very well, and he asked me if I wanted to be his business partner in this venture. I then proceeded to tell him, very nicely, just why his idea was one of the most foolish things I had ever heard of. It broke so many of the long-established rules of that business. The whole point of movie theaters, I told him, was to sell overpriced popcorn and soft drinks and candy, which had a huge profit margin. But to really make any money, you needed as many people as possible sitting in the theater seats. His plan meant spending 10 times more on food and personnel and then removing half of the audience. And on and on, I ticked off all the reasons and why his concept sounded really fun, but it would just never work. It was foolish. I'd been doing this for over a decade, so I knew better. He listened patiently and smiled and he said, okay. And about a year later, he opened the first location based on his idea and called it the Alamo Draft House. It was so successful. Within two years, he had 10 locations. And eventually he bought that very same theater where we had had that conversation and remodeled it into yet another Alamo Draft House. So that wasn't the first time I thought something sounded foolish and would never work because it went against conventional wisdom. And it probably won't be the last when I've been proven dead wrong and regretted that I didn't have the imagination or maybe the courage to be a little foolish. I guarantee you Ellen still wants to punch me very hard right now for that movie theater thing. And she doesn't even know about that Steve Jobs guy who wanted me to buy stock in something called Apple. I mean... Who needs their own computer you can carry around in your pocket? Ridiculous, I know. It'll never work. Nobody wants to be thought of as foolish. Maybe that's why we do tend to lean toward conventional and conservative ways of thinking and being, the tried and true. Even when the proven might not always be working out exactly the way we'd like, it's sometimes really hard to pull back and ask, is there a better way, a smarter way, maybe even a more faithful way to do things? A way that pursues the essential goals we have and the values we hold dear, but perhaps do it differently. Quite often, we can tend to place a whole lot of trust in institutions. In my story about the theater business, I was trusting that the model of that business institution was solid and unchanging. It worked. If it's not broken, why fix it? It simply didn't occur to me like it occurred to that friend that there were a whole lot of people out there who were not being well served or who would appreciate a different approach. Their needs were not being met by the conventional institutional wisdom that I believed was the one and only way. From the earliest years of the Christian movement, it's been understood that the message of Jesus of Nazareth went completely against conventional wisdom. For the average person, the words and actions of Jesus were delightful and healing and filled with hope. The person who was suffering from illness or poverty or uh, from the burden of a religious system and its social and political hierarchy that was really more interested in conformity and a view of God that was punitive, where your spiritual life and your very value as a person 
was completely dependent on following the strict rules and regulations. Otherwise, God would reject you and punish you, and you could definitely not be part of the community. But what Jesus taught and practiced was the exact opposite of that. He recognized the holiness and the inherent value within every person. He welcomed those who organized religion had rejected. Organized religion had said, you know, you're not quite good enough, but you might have a chance if you believe in the right stuff exactly the way we tell you to believe it and you just give us more money because, you know, we're building this big nice temple over here and we're really going to be needing your money. Jesus turned those conventional ways of thinking on their head by saying and demonstrating over and over again that God loves and welcomes and embraces poor people, sick people, immigrant people, people who didn't share the same religious beliefs, and people who'd been left out and devalued because of their gender or their status or their debility or their race or where they were born. And because of that, Jesus was a threat to the keepers of the established faith, the orthodox way of doing things. Every time Jesus opened his mouth, he called their power and their authority into question. He said, there's a better way, a different path, and it's not what you guys have been doing for a very long time. For preaching that message, for gaining a following, for challenging conventional wisdom, Jesus was tried and executed. And we can't forget that an essential piece of his message was that if God's love extends far beyond the limits placed on it by the religious gatekeepers, that love also extends well beyond the limits of what we know as life itself. Love doesn't die. It has a life of its own, beyond our ability to control, whether our physical bodies are living or dead. The name for that kind of life in the world of first century Palestine was resurrection. Life beyond the limitations we like to place on it, because love has no limits. Proclaiming that reality became the cause of the earliest Christian missionaries like the Apostle Paul. For their efforts, Paul and others like him were considered to be fools. After all, just like today, there's no hard evidence to prove that love exists between people or that life extends beyond death. How do you prove it when you say you love somebody? You can certainly express your love with affection and tenderness and even material tokens that represent love, but love itself is not something that ever shows up on the spectrum of light or that you can weigh on a scale. And believing that love and life also continues beyond death is also something you can't prove except through tears and memories and monuments. But when it comes down to it, those things are also just representations of something else, something we feel and we believe and we know in ways that we don't have the adequate language to express. We just know. When your baby child wraps her hand around your finger or you embrace a friend who's going through a crisis or when you caress the face of your dying parent, we know there's something more to this business of life than what our five senses can tell us, a whole lot more. And that more is infinite, unlimited love. For sharing that message, for saying that the reality was proven by the life and death and resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth, Paul and his friends were called fools. So, it's worth thinking about why we usually consider anyone to be a fool. Fool is someone who enters the situation where a certain way of thinking or behaving is accepted as normal and right, and then they turn that on its ear. Sometimes we laugh at fools because what they're doing is so beyond the norm, it strikes us as simply absurd, as maybe well-intentioned but dead wrong. And sometimes we think fools are dangerous, either to themselves or to us, because most of us are deeply invested in keeping things the way they are. Any, anyone suggesting change can make us really suspicious. But fools disrupt things. In the realm of business, a disruptor is a person or a company that's taking a different approach to a product or service, potentially disrupting the way an entire industry has operated for years. Just like my movie theater friend. 
For instance, the company called Heal, spelled H-E-A-L, provides virtual visits to the doctor and even house calls when that's needed. It's on-demand health care covered by insurance and less expensive than the traditional model. It's especially helpful for people who find it difficult to get to a doctor's office. Heal was created back in 2014 after its founder, Dr. Renee Dua, spent seven hours in an emergency room with her infant son. Was her idea called foolish initially? Was it resisted? And was Renee told, this will never work? Yeah. But as of last year, Heal was operating throughout 11 states, including California and New York, and recently, Humana Healthcare invested $100 million into it. So you might be thinking, well, that's interesting, but what does any of this have to do with me, with my life? Everything, I believe. That is, if you're willing to join me in daring to be foolish, Foolish for the sake of serving others, for the sake of doing things that buck conventional wisdom. Foolish so that together we can be a community of people who live in the reality of the unlimited love that Jesus shared and that Paul taught and that can bring together and heal and transform our world to be a fool for the sake of love. Now you're watching or listening to me speak today for any number of reasons and I'm thankful for that. But one reality is that I represent and work in the context of an institution, a church. I love our church, what we are and what we can be, or I wouldn't be doing this with my time and my life. The church is an institution in the sense that there are ways of being that have been around long before we were ever born. There are beliefs and rituals and expectations that affirm who we are. But I also understand the church not as a thing, we're not an inanimate object, we're certainly not a building, and we're not a static, unchanging organization of people. When I think of our church, I'm increasingly drawn to imagining our essential purpose, our reason for being, and the cause we serve, who we're here for, and why. What's the point of our existence? Why do we gather? And why do we do things like collect well over a ton of food, literally, 3,500 pounds of food in a few weeks' time for food pantries? Why do we make space for education in a support group for LGBTQ teenagers? Why do we have a monthly program where we learn about how to be engaged in important social justice issues? Now, for the time being, we're not getting together for worship in person, but hopefully that'll change within a few months' time. So why do we do this service online in the way that we do it? And by the way, we're going to continue doing it just like this after we reopen. And why will we be doing our in-person worship service the way we'll do it? Because it's different. Two, from the way that a lot of other churches like ours do worship. We're a lot more informal. We believe it's okay to have fun in church. We laugh, we cry, we hug. And asking why about all of that, the larger question is, are we willing to buck conventional wisdom? Are we willing to be disruptors? Are we willing to look, take a look around at us, at all the people we know who are not even aware that an unconventional church like Salem exists? And are we willing to meet them where they are and invite them to join us in what we're doing? Are we willing to be different enough that someone who has given up on organized religion, someone who says, you know, I'm spiritual but not religious, someone who's been rejected or made unwelcome elsewhere by a narrow and dogmatic approach to Christianity, will say, wow, this is different. This is not what I expected from a church. I need to be part of this. God's love extends far beyond the limits that anyone tries to place on it. And that love also extends beyond the limits of what we know as life itself. That belief is still unconventional, and in the eyes of many people, it's even foolish. But if being a fool means that you accept and love and serve others without limits, because you know you are accepted and loved and embraced by loving friends and by God, just the way you are, then here's an invitation. Let's be foolish together. Mm -hmm.